Hi, and thank you for joining me for our third and final week of our study of the book of Ruth. My name is Amy, and uh, I'm going to be walking you through Ruth 3, 6 through 9. But before we do that, let me just recap. So the last, last week we heard from the ladies about chapter 2, where Ruth and Boaz meet and they have been spending a lot of time together and getting to know each other and have had a few interactions. And uh, Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, has started putting a plan together to uh, secure a longer term uh, provision for her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And so if you want to catch up in more detail, I really encourage you to go back and watch the videos that the ladies have done for the last two weeks. You can catch those on Facebook or YouTube. Um, now we're going to start in Ruth 3, verses 6 through 9. So it says, She went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and, and, lay, at, at, and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? She answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. So we will stop there. And this would have been at the end of the harvest season. And so the two would have gotten to know each other pretty well throughout the weeks of harvest. But this would have been from a distance and in a group setting. But nonetheless, they had developed quite a great uh amount of respect and admiration for each other based on how they treated one another as well as those around them. And so this idea of the threshing floor was the final step in the harvest where they would separate the grain from the chaff. And because this was taking place in the time of the judges, it was a time of great social unrest. And so Boaz would have wanted to protect his harvest from any kinds of thieves or gangs of people coming in to do his, uh, his hard work, some sort of harm. And so he would have wanted to spend the night to protect it against those thieves. And this idea of thieves is a pretty common uh, reference in the Bible. It's usually a metaphor for Satan or something unexpected or unwelcome that's happening. But it got me thinking about in 1 Thessalonians, where it actually represents the day of the Lord and that it will be an unexpected surprise when Christ comes again. And so I want to ask myself and everybody else, how can you be vigilant against the plots and attacks of the enemy? But also, how will you prepare for the day of the Lord? Because uh, if you are in Christ, you have nothing to fear, but you do have things to prepare for and others to get ready with you. Now, the next thing we see is that Ruth followed her mother-in-law Naomi's instructions, and those were to prepare herself actually like a bride. And so she was supposed to wash herself and anoint herself with perfume and oil and put on her best garment. And this was really to symbolize that she was getting ready for a wedding. She was getting ready for a huge marriage proposal. And so she went in and once Boaz had laid down, she uncovered his feet. And this is a very strange sort of, uh, sort of idea to us. Like, what does that mean? Was it just some weird custom that they had back then? Was it code for some sort of like sexual or romantic gesture that she was making? Uh, I think actually, according to the 
the things that I've studied and what we know about her and Boaz's characters is that this was actually an act of submission because this was the role that a servant would take in laying at his master's feet so that he was ready to do anything that his master asked him to do. And so she was coming in and presenting herself not as a victim, not as this poor widow that needed help, but as a humble servant. And she was expressing great respect and trust and actually surrender to Boaz. And this really is a, uh, a, a great picture of what marriage should look like in a godly context. And it reminded me to go look at Ephesians 5 in verse 22 and following. It says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, and also wives should submit to in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything, any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are the members of his body. <clears throat> Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying this that the, it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So in our culture, what is laid out here is really radical, right? We don't often hear of submission in a positive light. And we, uh, we're told that wives are to submit to their husbands. No questions asked, no caveats, no ifs, ands, or buts. And that husbands likewise are to love their wives sacrificially as Christ has loved us in the church. And so for it to work, both parties have to be fully surrendered to each other and to the process. And what we learn in Ephesians is that this is actually a beautiful picture of Christ and his church that he loves his church like a, like a husband loves his bride. And that's beautiful to me. And so, so then it gets me thinking about marriage and my marriage. And you can, you can think and contemplate your own relationship that you're in as well, or future relationship, <clears throat> and ask yourself, how can you fully, more fully, commit to loving your partner as it's laid out here in Ephesians 5. Now the next thing that we see in Ruth is that Boaz is startled in the middle of the night and wakes up and he is on high alert because as we've already discussed he was there to guard his grain against thieves and this is where Ruth makes her big ask. And she says, take me under your wing. And this is an overt marriage proposal. Uh, this is something that is still seen actually in Jewish wedding ceremonies. And it's a beautiful thing is that the, the husband will take part of his cloak and lay it over his wife's head as a symbol of his protection of her. And uh, we actually see this referenced several times in the Psalms and other Old Testament books where God is promising to protect his people. And he says he spreads his wings over us. 
and she says, Put, marry me because you are my relative or my goel that Kayla talked about last week. It's this word goel that means kinsman redeemer. And so it would have been a close relative of Elimelech, who was her father-in-law who had died in Moab. And the job of the kinsman redeemer, the purpose of that was to be able to buy their relative out of slavery or avenge them for a violent crime. They would be able to buy back family land that would have otherwise fallen out of the family, or they would carry on the family name through an heir. And this, uh, this made them responsible for safeguarding the person as well as the property and the posterity or the the going on of the family for the widows in that family and so that was what ruth was presenting to boaz she is bringing it to his attention that he was her kinsman redeemer and therefore had these responsibilities but like we have already discussed she wasn't coming to him as a victim but rather in humble submission and uh, a very pure love and so jesus is often also referred to as our redeemer and it's just a beautiful picture of how he brings back things that we thought were lost things that we thought we were surrendered to slavery and he buys us back through his blood to have a right relationship with god and so what i want to leave you with today is where do you need redemption? Where do you need God's redeeming power in your life? And I want you to think on that and pray on that. And I'll close us in prayer before we go. God, thank you so much for the story of Ruth and how it, uh, how it demonstrates your own love for us. God, and that we can see in marriage relationships how deeply and sacrificially you love your church, God. And please help us to be um, beacons of that love as we fulfill the Great Commission to be your church in the world. Um, please be with us as we go about our day and help us to consider ways that we need to more fully surrender to you to let you redeem the areas in our lives that we need to give over to you. We love you, God, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.